Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you who are following and watching along with this edition of the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame's Hall Call Interview Series. Uh, I am Will Driscoll, the Executive Director here at the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, and I hope the new year has gotten off to a great start for everyone uh, who's following along today. Um, as always, before we get started, I love to thank our sponsors here at the Hall of Fame who help us put on events like Hall Call, this platform, as well as our future events, including our induction, which we'll get into in just a second. But thank you to Priority Automotive, the City of Virginia Beach, Davcon Inc., Optima Health, uh, ESPN Radio 94.1, and our friends at the Hampton Road Sports Commission. Thank you for everything that you all do. Well, this is our first Hall Call of the new year. And uh, what better way to kick it off than talking about our upcoming 2022 induction? Uh, today is actually the 100-day countdown until the induction events this, uh, this coming April, April 30th, uh, Saturday, April 30th. And what's going to make this year much more unique and different than in years past is because of everything that's gone on the last couple of years, this is actually going to be a bigger celebration. So we have the class of 2020, we have the distinguished Virginian for the year of 2020, and we also have the class of 2022. And featured in that class of 2022 is a trailblazing basketball coach and the focal point of today's hall call, Sonny Allen. But Sonny Allen was from West Virginia. He's a West Virginia native, uh, made his connection to the Commonwealth through a decade coaching ODU men's basketball uh, for 10 seasons from 1965 through 1975. His ODU teams won 181 games, made six NCAA tournament division two appearances and won the 1975 NCAA division two national championship. Now that's all great on the court, but his impact extended well beyond the court as well. And to help us kind of go through his life and legacy, uh, we have two people with us today. We have Billy Allen, the son of the late coach, Sonny Allen, and we have Harry Minium from Old Dominion University Athletics. And, uh, and we're gonna have a, hopefully have a, a good conversation and really learn more about what his impact was on and off the court. So Billy and Harry, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot, Will. So obviously this is on Facebook Live. So if there are any questions, please feel free to jump on the stream and we'll do our best to get them over to either Harry or Billy. But I can't go any further without quickly mentioning the class of 2022. Uh, as I mentioned, it does feature Sonny Allen from ODU Basketball, John Lugbill, International Whitewater Canoeing Champion, Anthony Poindexter, All-American Safety from uh, the University of Virginia Football, and Chris Warren, a three-time Pro Bowl running back and Ferrum University alum. But Billy, I'll go ahead and start with you. When you hear the term Sonny Allen, Virginia Sports Hall of Fame inductee, what does that mean to you? I tell you, Will, we were so thrilled. Uh, it brought joy to our whole family. Uh, our dad lived a wonderful life and uh, has a really amazing story. As we talked about uh, you know, previously before this call, um, he's got a lot of achievements, but there's things that he did outside of basketball that made a huge impact. And uh, it's, it's really, really special. We got an excited group of family and friends. <laughs> That's Wait, always me, good to hear. Let me tell you how special it was to Billy. He, uh, after you called him, he called me, and left me a voicemail. I was in a meeting and he was crying. So uh, there, there you go, world. You know, he, he got very emotional and so did his sisters. I mean, it, was, it means so much to their family. It really does. Well, as the executive director here, I, I love hearing that because, and, I, and you know, it was a very special conversation that Billy and I had when I was able to make that call. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's important that a Hall of Fame is important. And, uh, and, and, you know, with people like Harry and people like the Allen family, that definitely helps in, in what we do here at the Hall of Fame. But, um, but, you know, after he left ODU, he was here for 10 years, but he also coached at SMU and he coached in Nevada. And then he even had a couple of professional stints. But why was his time at ODU so important, Billy? Well, that, he was a young coach back then. He took over a program back when it was Old Dominion College and uh, <clears throat> very few scholarships, didn't even have a gym to play in. They played in some high school gyms. As Harry knows, that small on-campus facility, it always sat maybe a couple hundred people just for practice. And uh, so he was only 29 when he got there. And uh, he, uh, he had his most success there. Uh, that was his home. Um, that's where my three, you know, 
sisters uh, are from and just a great, great uh, memory back then. And he had a lot of success after that, but his time at Old Dominion, just very, very special. And to cap it off with the national championship was just awesome. And I, this is one of the things, Will, when we talked about bringing things back to the Hall of Fame event, this mm -hmm. was the basketball court, a piece of it, when they won the championship in 1975. <laughs> so I was able to get this. Uh, so I keep this here at the house, but it's gonna go to Virginia Beach in April. And that's that's great. I mean, that is a that's a really unique piece of history right there. <laughs> uh, speaking of history, Harry, you know, you you spent decades at the Virginian Pilot prior to your current role at, at ODU. So you you've covered Sonny throughout the course of his his career, even here in Virginia and then outside of Virginia. Um, what was something that stuck out to you about Coach Allen um, that that was either something basketball focused or just a, a characteristic personality trait about him? Well, the first thing is I, I never really covered Sonny until at, long after he'd left ODU. I was, as a kid, I grew up watching his teams play. And um, I was just intrigued with, the, with his fast break. I mean, they, you know, by the time a shot went up, they had, they had two guys running down the court. And there was you know, not a lot of defense played because you couldn't afford to play a lot of defense. But it's, I think one of the most important things about Sonny Allen is, is uh, there are two things he did that really changed ODU. Number one, he laid the foundation for them to move to Division I. They were playing in high school gyms. By the time he left, we were playing in the field house, 5,000 people for a good game. Some games were played at Scope. He had beaten a number of Power Five schools. Bobby Knight in Indiana had come to Scope, if you can imagine that. They were Division Two, and he got Bobby Knight in Indiana at Scope. And Dave Torzig missed the last second shot, and they would have won. I mean, it, you know, this from a program that a few years earlier, they, one of their major rivals was Hampton Sydney. So, uh, and the second, so he 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 built a fan base. He built a tradition of winning that ODU had not really had. Um, he won a national championship and then, you know, he had done what, you know, he had planned to do there, but the second way he changed old dominion. And I think it was his most, um, it's, it speaks most for what a good person he was is how he integrated college basketball. He came to ODU in 1965 and it wasn't that much earlier than that. And Norfolk closed the schools rather than, well, the state closed Norfolk schools rather than. Uh, desegregate. The Norfolk schools were not desegregated. This was a very segregated area in 1965. I, I lived here then. And he came here and he had a, a discussion with the athletic director and said, I want to recruit black basketball players. And, um, you know, I know some details of that conversation. It was a long conversation with Bud Matheny and Sonny had to make his case. And he did. And he, uh, he recruited Button Speaks, then Bob Pritchett, and those guys faced a lot of discrimination on the road. Um, a little bit here at Old Dominion, but that paved the way for other schools. All of a sudden, Virginia, Virginia Tech, all these other schools were recruiting black players. I took a lot of courage, uh, and that just that just speaks for the good man that Sonny was. You know, you, I, I want to kind of talk about that decision and that belief system that he had you know obviously in the 1960s you alluded to it, 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 it i don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure that out but that was an unpopular opinion you know why was why was he willing to you know we're talking about a head coaching job and these these jobs just don't come around every day why was he willing to stake his reputation on that um to make sure that he could open that up as opposed to just saying well i'll take the next job available if they won't let me do that well, Billy, did you want to answer that one? Or? Go ahead, here. Okay. I mean, he's he. I mean, his background. He grew up in Moundsville, West Virginia. And Billy, correct me if I get any of this wrong. His uh, dad left uh, when he was a kid, and you know, his his mom raised them. They were dirt poor, and they were really poor. And so I think Sonny knew what it was like, you know, to be down and out. Um, you know, there's a definitely back then there was a caste, a class system in the country, and. Um, and when he went to Marshall and, uh, and by the way, he, he graduated from high school. He had no scholarship offers. So he worked in a steel mill for a year, saved his money and then walked on at Marshall, paid for a scholarship and earned a scholarship. And while he was there, he roomed with Hal Greer. And I, I talked with him, you know, briefly several years ago about why he did this. He just says, everyone deserves an equal chance. We're all, we're all equal in God's eyes. And he was just determined at that time 
that if he's going to be a head coach, he's going to have black players. And otherwise, he's not going to be associated with that school. Very brave thing to do back then. Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, 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 the much different world than, than what we are today. But Billy, I kind of want to talk about a little bit of the basketball side of, of your dad. If you had described if you had to describe your dad as a coach in one word, what would it be? Well, Dave Torzik summed this up. He said his greatest strength was make it simple. So I think simple. And that's how the fast break started. He Numbered had the numbered system, a one man, a two man, a three, four, and five, and each person had their role. So we kept it very, very simple. But uh, if, if you're looking at one word, it has to be fast break. That's what he's known for. Uh, he's a legend in that. And uh, uh, that, that's how it's summed up. And I wanted to go back just on some of Harry's comments, Will, earlier. I never get tired of hearing Harry tell stories about my dad. We had so many conversations with my dad regarding Harry's words in writing. Um, it's amazing. My dad would always say, how in the world does Harry put these special words together and capture somebody's life in an article that sums it all up? And each time Harry would write an article, he would read it over. We'd talk about it. I'd be out there with him in Reno. We'd visit. We'd FaceTime with uh, my sisters. And he was always amazed and grateful that Harry could do that. Um, I still stay in touch very closely with Button Speaks. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we swapped a few messages this morning and I told him I was gonna be on here today. But Button said when my dad recruited him, the only thing that he said was, uh, that his mom asked was, are you gonna take care of my son? Yeah. And my dad said, yes, I will. And Buttons was born at the same high school, or same, <clears throat> hospital that I was in Huntington, West Virginia, Huntington High School there. And uh, that was just, my dad said he was the best player available and I was gonna go after him. And he made a promise to his mom and Button said over all these years, he held up to that. That's, that's a great legacy to, to, uh, to carry on. Um, you know, even after he was done coaching and even now, um, even now, as we look ahead to the induction, it's, it's uh, wonderful to hear how 50 years later, that's st those feelings or the sentiment is still the same. But you talked about the fast break, uh, yeah. getting back to basketball, you talked about the fast break. And, you know, did he ever explain to either of you why that was his preferred choice of play? I mean, you're talking to a Temple alum right here where I, I watched John Chaney for years and we yeah. were comfortable in the 50s and 60s. And we even yeah. saw UVA win a championship like that a couple of years ago where they liked the games slowed down. Why was it? Why was this up tempo style the way that he wanted to play? I think it started when he was at Marshall. Um, so he was a walk on, as Harry said there, um, ended up working his way uh, through the first year, earned a scholarship his next couple of years. But he was on a team with Hal Greer, one of the gr greatest players in NBA history, top 50. And then Leo Bird was the leading scorer of that team. And not a lot of people realize that. They averaged 88 points a game back with no shot clock and uh, no three-point line. So I think because of that with Hal Greer and Leo Bird, that uh, that got him interested in high scoring basketball. And then that's when Dave said he wanted to simplify it and have, you know, a point guard that can run the show. And first it was Button Speaks, and then it was Dave Torsey. Uh, there's Rick Now, Dick St. Clair, Joey Carruthers, Oliver Purnell, a long list of what he would call one men that would run the fast break and they would carry out uh, the duties of that. And everybody had their role. But I think it started back. Um, at Marshall with their high scoring offense there. Yeah, that that's that's amazing because you, you hear about no shot clock, um, you know, no three point line. You know, this isn't Dean Smith in the four corners. The, yeah. These guys are running up and down yeah. the court trying to score. And I think one of the most amazing stats, particularly from that time, is his 67 68 team averaged 98 points a game. I was trying to find out exactly, since we are at the 100-day mark, I was trying to find the actual schedule that year to see how many times that year they went over 100, but I couldn't find it in any of the archives. But I can only assume it was quite frequently if they're averaging 98 points a game. If anybody knows that, Harry will find that out, because <laughs> my dad said he knows everything. 
I don't have a press guide with me. I wish I did. But I, yeah, right. I, think, I think they scored, I think it was 148 points against RPI, Richmond Professional yeah. Institute, which is, mm -hmm. um, by the way, VCU now. So yeah. they, even then, it was a rivalry with VCU. Um, yeah. Gotcha. They scored so many points, they made them change the name. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How would he have utilized the three point shot in today's game? Well, he would have, you know, they, they would have probably had probably another 18 to 20 points because he always had shooters. You know, the one man was the one in charge of distributing the ball, yeah. but he had shooters all the way around. That game you talked about that Harry mentioned uh, against RPI at the time, now VCU, Bob Pritchett had 67 points. And so he, he basically outscored by himself a lot of teams during that, that time. And, uh, and then with the shot clock, shot clock would have never come into effect with a Sonny Allen team. I mean, it was get the ball and go and see how fast you can shoot. I mean, he would want to be baseline to baseline in less than three seconds. And uh, he had plays that they would run outside of the fast break offense and formation, but it was all being aggressive and taking the ball to the basket. But he always had, he had shooters. Uh, every team that he had, they could fill it up. A volume shooting team, I guess, is I think that's what that would be called today. <laughs> yes. Yes. Dave you know, Torsley told me an interesting story about Sonny. Um, you know, he he knew Sonny. It, by the way, Dave Torzik would not have played college basketball were it not for Sonny. He wouldn't have played in the ABA or NBA. Sonny found him at a tournament, I think, in Hershey, Pennsylvania, yes. and uh, chased him down in the locker room, uh, excuse me, in the parking lot. And uh, Dave was, in a, I'm kind of in a hurry to get home, uh, but he wound up taking a visit and coming here. And, and Dave said that changed his life. But Dave said, you know, Sonny, like any coach, got upset from time to time. But he said, I never in all my life heard him utter a cuss word once. Not once. Not one time. Now, I, if I could go a day without doing that, I'd be. <laughs> uh, that's, that's simply amazing yeah, to me. He was always mild-mannered. He would get his point across, but he was had a special way of doing it. And, uh, I mean, I have several stories I wanted to share. Hopefully, we had time here that talk about some of that, but he, he was something he, he coached a lot of years and really didn't raise his voice. He kept everything mild mannered, but when he wanted something done, you knew it had to get done. He had that gift of getting those, getting the word across. Well, Joey Carruthers told me a story. He's Joey had um, kind of erupted on the court. They lost to Norfolk state and in, in NCAA regional at Old Dominion. And he had uh, Norfolk state player had been, um, kind of aggressive on a foul or something. And Joey had mouthed off at him and had to come to the bench. And um, he says, Sonny looked at me and said, you know, you, you played a lousy game and you just did something lousy on the court. So go sit down and think about it. Very, you know, no yelling, just sort of told him. And Joey said the message got through. Yeah. You know, it's, you, you mentioned you want to share some stories and there may actually be some crossover with a couple of the things that, that I'm going to, that we're going to get to because yeah. You know, we we receive nominations and then with those nominations, depending on the nominee, there's a lot of letters of support, recommendation or just um, just peers reaching out to make sure that, you know, the nomination gets seen. And the file for for Sonny was was growing I and mean, it, it was growing exponentially. And, and I went through and I read, you know, almost every single one of these. And I pulled out a, a few things that that may tie into some of the stories and. And one of them was, and I can't remember exactly who it said, but they, one of the comments was, Sonny fully understood it's not where or who you coach, but why you coach. And, and you know, just being his son, being around him and his basketball career, what was his why? Yeah, he, it, that came from Dale Brown. I remember that one. And I, I had a list of, I keep those uh, letters here in a file. And uh, that... That's what he grew up. He wanted to give everybody a chance. And like Harry said, he, he was not gonna go to college um, coming out of high school. Uh, he was you know, trying to make his way, make some money and get a job. After about a year of doing that in the steel mill, he said, I wanna go to college. And I think once he did that, he said, I wanna give everybody an opportunity. This is what I love doing. I love the impact that uh, coaches and teachers had on me. And he goes, I want to pass that along to other people. And he has influenced so many 
around the country. The, the outpouring has been unbelievable. Um, you know, family, you know, my kids, my daughters and grandkids, um, they just love their Papa Sonny. And he has a unique gift, the way he is, deals with people. He treats everybody the way they should be treated. And um, he just, he lived an amazing life, has an amazing story. And um, I'm just grateful that um, other people get to hear some of this and he's gonna be enshrined in Virginia Beach uh, from here on out. And it's, that just makes it extra special. Billy, um, tell, uh, speak about be a good citizen and what has, what that has done. Okay, this one, uh, my youngest daughter, or my youngest sister, Kelly, uh, when she graduated from college, and we talked about Dave saying my dad would always simplify things. So he sent her a card the day she graduated and uh, said, this is what it said, proud of you, work hard, be a good citizen, save your money, life is good, have a great day. That's what he listed. And just that basically summed up everything. It covers a lifetime of experiences right there. So uh, my sisters got together and when my dad passed away, they said, what can we do to have a yearly celebration? And we, uh, my sisters came up with this idea to be a good citizen day. And uh, they printed up t-shirts and March 8th, every year on March 8th, my dad's birthday is going to be Sonny Allen, be a good citizen day. And they, we've gone out and done things at churches, uh, the homeless shelters. Um, there's a highway in North Carolina that my sister Jackie got adopted that says Sonny Allen, be a good citizen highway. Yeah. Um, and we're always looking for new things that we can do and contribute uh, to carry on his legacy like that. But those, those words right there, um, we, we, we laugh about it because it was just so simple. And we look at it and we cry and get emotional every time. And my sisters all said, and my daughter said, all right, dad and brother, do not cry, hold it together. And then they said, hey, it doesn't matter. If you do get emotional, that's okay, because that's why we're on here. And you, Will and Harry, you guys already heard me cry when we were talking. So uh, that, that is Sonny Allen, Be a Good Citizen Day. Uh, they even opened up a Facebook page and they put stories and pictures on there and it's gonna to continue to grow. But uh, that, that was really a cool thing. Well, well, we'll definitely push people to the Sonny Allen Be a Good Citizen page. Um, you know, we, like I said, we love social media here at the Hall of Fame. And, and I think anything, anything that's good um, is, is, is something that should be shared. And I think being a good citizen is something that should definitely be shared amongst everybody, all ages, races, creeds, everything. Um, you know, a, another, another de description that came through um, pretty clear when reading through, you know, the letters and everything that, that, came, um, that came to the hall was George Raveling, um, you know, longtime college basketball coach uh, for Iowa, USC. He described him as a coach's coach. You know, we've heard players coach, we've heard coaches player, but we've, I've never really heard the term coach's coach. What is a coach's coach? I think it's somebody that really understands the true meaning of why you do it. I mean, when Dale Brown said that, hey, he, he gave everything he had, this is what my dad did. He, he worked with other coaches, young coaches, older coaches. He used to have coaching clinics that coaches from all around the country, some of the greatest of all time would come and uh, spend time there with it. And just talk about the fast break. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned Coach Raveling. Coach Raveling is a special friend of my dad's. And uh, that's the one, I had a letter sitting here that has some of the details about it. But Coach Raveling was on the steps of the Lincoln uh, uh, Monument, the Lincoln Memorial in DC in August 28, 1963 for Dr. King's speech. Wow. And um, he was literally right side by side with Dr. King when he gave that speech. He leaned over to him afterwards and said, can I have those notes? So Coach Raveling has those notes in his possession after all these years. And that's why this means so much. We just celebrated Dr. King's birthday. Uh, 
and everything that my dad stood for. And this is what Coach Raveling said in that letter. He said, Sonny made his living as an educator, a coach, a mentor, a servant leader, influencer, social activist, and role model. Among my many keen observations of Sonny are these uncommon traits, daring, truthful, curious, creative, optimistic, disciplined, compassion, humble, and honest. And then he closed with this, his extraordinary achievements are rivaled only by his personal strengths. And, uh, you know, Coach Robin has a special document from Dr. King. And we always thought of this as an unbelievable special document that Coach Rabin gave to our family. And it's in the, the file there. And I think that had a huge amount to do with the committee and, and reviewing my dad's uh, nomination. And so grateful for Coach Raveling, Larry Brown, uh, Del Harris, uh, Paul Westhead, uh, just a wide range of family and friends. Um, I go back though with Harry, he wrote those beautiful words year after year. And uh, those are words that we'll never forget. And um, we're thankful to Wood Seelig. Wood Seelig was my neighbor, my classmate, my teammate, and my friend over all these years. So that makes it extra special too. Uh, having my buddy Wood, he would be over there at our house and dinner. And my dad saw him play as a young kid. And we'd go into the gym at the field house and, and, and go through the back door on a weekend if it was open and, and shoot hoops there. So there's, I could go every day and not be able to express my thankfulness and gratitude for our family and for my dad's nomination into this. Um, just really, really special. You know, Harry, um, I'll give Billy just a second there. That, that was, that was, yeah. Those were wonderful words. And just, it, it, you really see the depth and the reach that your dad had um, just in that basketball community and the sports community in general. But Harry, you know, you mentioned that you didn't necessarily cover Sonny when he was here, but you've spent hours, days, weeks, I, I don't know the exact amount of time learning um, about, about what he did at ODU and just his overall impact. Throughout that process, is there something that you learned that you didn't know prior uh, about Sonny Allen, about him as a basketball coach or him as a person? Like, is there, is there one other thing that sticks out? I asked you about the characteristic that you, that you kind of already knew, but what's something that you learned throughout this process? Quite frankly, as a kid, I, I did not know he integrated college basketball mm -hmm. because when I started watching him, Button Speaks and Bob Pritchett were playing. And, you know, I, I grew up in an integrated area. I just thought it was normal. So the, the thing that um, when I, you know, many, many, many decades later, when I thought about it and realized how the country was back then, and it just amazed me that he did that. At the time, it was no big deal because I was playing, you know, with black kids in, in middle school and all that. But um, just for someone in, in, as you said, to put his – you know, a coaching job on the line for that was, was, you know, simply an amazing thing to do. The, the thing that, that I remember about Sonny is when I was a kid, I, I idolized Sonny. Um, I went and um, he wrote a book. It, what's the name of it, Billy? This, the Sonny Allen fast break. The Sonny Allen fast break book. Yep. Yeah, I, I still have, I bought the book and, uh, yeah. you know, I went in and I wrote a check for like $3 or whatever That's it was. Exactly what it was. Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I, I come in and pick up the book and Sonny comes out in the hallway and he says, I want to know who the heck is buying my book. And so I introduced myself and I was, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's like meeting the president. You know, he, he was, I was, I liked him so much. Um, and that is the only time I had ever met Sonny until um, and actually never saw him face to face again on a one to one basis. We just talked by phone after that. By the way, I've never met Billy face to face either. I'll be beating him. Um, uh, went at an old Dominion game on old Dominion host Marshall, but yeah, um, it, it's not, you know, his, his, the, the one thing I'll say is that that basketball, the style of play was just so entertaining. You could never look down and they won the, the fan base just built naturally. Um, it's sort of kind of like what, you know, when old Dominion started football, all of a sudden you had 20,000 fans and, and it didn't happen quite that quickly in basketball, but it was, they went pretty quickly from two or 300 people to 
you know, 1800 sellouts at Lake Taylor or Wilson High School. And, um, and then when the field house opened, uh, you know, they just drew amazing crowds. You, you talk about, I, I kind of want to go back to the, the fast break philosophy there for just a, just a moment, but what was the motivation for numbering the positions? Like, they, did he ever kind of tell you guys like why he decided, you know, this is going to make it, this is going to simplify this system by calling the point guard one all the way up through the center at five. I mean, Dave Torzik told me it, it, that was part of simplifying it. Number one guard, you know, you know, the, the four and fives were trailing. It just everyone had, here's what you do in offense. And it was very simple. You know, one sentence, here's what you do. And, um, you know, by numbering the people, it was, you know, okay, here's your job when you're at center. Here's your job when you're at point guard. So um, that was what Dave Torzik said about the numbering system. And it's amazing that no one had, had, numbered, had used numbers before. Yeah, and that <laughs> you know, I guess when you're still playing a much slower world. style, you might not need that uh, that simplification. It's already fairly simple. Just keep passing to the open guy. Uh, but, you know, Dave Twardzik, Dave Twardzik is an inductee here at the Hall of Fame. I've heard his name multiple times during this conversation. But, you know, he's on record as saying that the foundation of ODU basketball success over the last half century, and there's been plenty of it, was laid in those 10 years with Sonny Allen as head coach, you know, Norfolk was a Norfolk in the sixties was a lot different. It wasn't quite as well known. You know, how was he able to take this small up and coming school and turn it into to something that became, you know, nationally recognized? I think the style that number one, he won. Um, and number two, he, it was just the style of play. Um, and he was willing to play anyone. He played Elizabeth city. He played Norfolk state. You know, he didn't, he didn't care who it was. Um, um, you know, when you have a winning program that plays an exciting brand of basketball and you start going to the NCAA tournament after years before, you know, playing essentially division, what are now division three schools that attracts attention. And we didn't have the internet, you know, we had three TV stations, you know, um, you got your news to the newspaper and there wasn't there fans were a lot more willing to go out back then than they are now, I think in, in many ways. And, um, it became the place to be because of Sonny. Old Dominion went Division I uh, a year after Sonny left. That wouldn't have happened if Sonny hadn't been there. Uh, they, he, he built the fan base. He, he, you know, they didn't raise a lot of money back then. They finally started raising money. Uh, they started playing Division I schools. And I, I think that was a big draw, too, because, you know, when you're able to play Indiana and Mississippi State and schools like that at home, especially at Scope, you know, that draws fans. So, I mean, he, and I think he went to seven NCAA tournaments. Was, was it six or seven that you mentioned? I said six. I, yeah. I could be wrong, but that, that's, what I, that's what I saw in the old Bud Matheny <laughs> archives. <laughs> okay. anyway, it's, uh, it was, and they just played amazing games. You know, some of the games uh, in, in later years against VCU and Norfolk State, I mean, they were epic games against Norfolk State. You know, they would fill scope. Uh, you know, it just, and without that, there, there would be, the Old Dominion would not have been Division One in 1977, and um, and you, you know who knows what kind of success they would have had. the The foundation for their success in their first year in Division One, when I believe they won 21 games in a row, and they beat Georgetown, and they beat Virginia, and they almost beat Syracuse to get to the NCAA tournament. Those players were the foundation for that team. Two years, you know, that team that Sonny recruited. Um, you know, Jeff Furman, Joey Carruthers, Wilson Washington. Yeah. Um, you know, they led them to a Division II national title and they led them into instant success in Division I. And those were Sonny's guys. Billy, do you remember anything in particular about that national championship team? Like, like what, what was it about that team that was able to get over the hump that year? Well, they went in <clears throat> and you had to win three games in a row back to back to back there in Evansville, Indiana. They'd been there once in 71. So uh, there was, you know, a little history on that, but they, they hung together. And one of the strengths that everybody talks about my dad's fast break, but they said one of his uh, other things is the two, three zone defense. They had, they did a terrific job against some of those teams there. They played New Orleans in the championship and they had a future, pro player, Wilbur Holland. 
and they played a zone defense. And I think that was a, a thing that kind of gets overlooked over the years that he would do that before. I think he was one of the first ones to incorporate that kind of a defense. You know, people were playing man to man. And then over the years that had changed a little bit, but um, we had a terrific, I remember the crowd coming in from, uh, from Norfolk for the game. And I told Harry this a while back uh, when we were out looking through some of my dad's notes, I look back then you would get, you know, there's no social media. We had Western union telegrams. And I looked at the stack of Western Union messages that people sent over all the years, players, parents, um, government officials. Uh, Paul Webb sent one from Randolph Macon. And uh, Paul Webb has stayed friend with my dad over all these years too. So there's so much history within the university there and then for coach Webb to come over after my dad was there and all that to tie in. Um, they built a terrific foundation there at the university and we're going to be Monarch fans forever. But that 75 team, um, that was a really special team. My dad talks about that. He gave me his NCAA championship final four watch from 71 when he got the 1970 watch himself. So I have the 71 watch. He's got the one that says champions from 75. But uh, it, it, they were close games there. They were battles and uh, just an awesome, awesome time. You know, I still remember we stayed at the University Inn. I mean, this is, you know, 1975, you know, so 45 years ago. I remember staying at the University Inn Hotel in Evansville, Indiana, and playing, you know, air hockey or shooting pool in the lobby with Wilson, Oliver, Tommy Street, Joey Carruthers, Jeff Herman, you know, everybody there, Wendell Morrison. And because uh, I was only a few years younger at that, at that time I was 15. So they kind of let me hang around with them. And uh, it was pretty, it was really awesome. When you, you know, I grew up in Norfolk. So I've, I've kind of been around the ODU basketball, or at least it's been in my consciousness since I was a kid. And you know, in this role, I've learned a lot more about the history of ODU basketball. And, you know, when you see them both, you know, the, the success that the men and women have had, and you go from the field house, and now you're at the TED, and you just have this, this great lineage, you know, what does it mean to you and your family that there's a, a, a good driver in all of this success was those 10 years that your dad spent yeah. on the sidelines? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's awesome, because everybody reaches out and it, it ties everybody together. Uh, Tommy Conrad, who my dad recruited, he was my dad's last recruit, didn't play for him. He called me the other day. He's going to be in there for the February 3rd game against Marshall uh, there. So it's not just the players that my, played for my dad. It's over the years and the bond that we've all developed. And, um, you know, we, we have a group coming in for that game on the 3rd and then an even bigger group coming to Virginia Beach in uh, late April. And, uh, yeah, it's – it's a bond there. That was just an awesome time. And like I said, I was right around that age. I was a freshman in high school there uh, with, with Wood when they won the championship. So, you know, I can remember those special times because like I said, Joey and Jeff Furman, they were young. They were only sophomores. Uh, Oliver Purnell, he was, you know, the leader of that team. He was the captain. And then Wilson Washington was a transfer. He was still young too. He was only a sophomore. So, uh, I, I just loved it that those guys took me in, let me hang out with them at practice and, uh, you know, play horse with me and things afterwards and, and all that. And it's, it's great. One of the other players on that team was Tommy Street. Tommy Street went to James Blair High School in Williamsburg. And um, after a lot of years out of getting out of Old Dominion, Tommy Street said, hey, Bruce Hornsby said to tell you a hello. And Bruce Hornsby, the legendary musician, uh, was a camper at the Sonny Allen Fast Break Camp when he was in high school. And so my dad goes, wow. So he would have had to been, you know, seventh, eighth grade, something like that. My dad and Bruce Hornsby have developed a friendship over all the years. And my dad went to a number of his concerts. Me and my wife, Lisa, have been to uh, several of his concerts. And I told Harry about this. When he read Harry's article that he was, my dad was inducted to the Hall of Fame. We've got all kinds of letters, but he sent me a text. 
He said, I was so happy to read about the news. Your dad was a beautiful cat. Loved him as you know. So he's, I just thought that was so cool coming from Bruce Hornsby. Your dad was a beautiful cat. You know, just something cool. It summed up the best phrase that Bruce could have summed up with those words. And uh, again, the relationships continue after all these years and that we have a bond. And Harry mentioned, we have never met. I feel like he's one of my best friends of all time. <laughs> Those, my sister Jackie and Kelly, and we'll meet Jennifer coming up here soon. But you are a family friend for everybody, and we love you. <laughs> You're on the Christmas card list now, Harry. Yeah, they're on. They're on my Christmas card list. Too. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of interesting. You you mentioned um, you know Hornsby, and he wrote a letter, I think, to you guys. Uh, it's interesting the diversity of people who wrote letters that you know I recruited some of these people but Bruce Smith you know Bruce says well tell me about Sonny and I told him and he says I'll write the letter I'll have it to you and he had it to me the next day I, I texted Ralph Northam and said you know Ralph um you know would you be willing to write this and he knew Sonny Allen's history and he wrote a really nice letter that you guys you guys got um Kenny Alexander the mayor of Norfolk he knew his history. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'll be glad to do it. He's a, Kenny's an old dominion graduate. So, I mean, they're just, a. we had a lot of people from the political world too, who, who yeah. knew Sonny's history and what he'd done for racial reconciliation. Um, which at the time when we were nominated, you know, when we, and by the way, let me tell you a story. I, I had talked with Sonny and I knew he wasn't in the hall of fame and I talked with Dave Torzik. So I went to Wood Selig and I said, Wood, do you mind if I lead a campaign to try and get Sonny in to the uh, Hall of Fame? And he says, hell yeah, go for <laughs> it, man. <laughs> so, and that's that's what led to me really discovering a lot of things about Sonny that I didn't know, especially his um, his background as a kid. You know, you, so many athletes these days have the same background and athletics, you know, sort of, you know, pull them through. Um, I think Sonny would have been successful had he stayed at the steel mill, but uh, he came from very humble beginnings. And I think that, that shaped his life and um, helped make him such a good person. Well, this, um, this has been a wonderful conversation with both of you. Um, it's, it's exciting because as for those who don't know, this is going to be our first induction since 2019. Um, the, the 2020 induction, we were six weeks out when the pandemic hit. So this is very exciting for us, and, and it's great that on this this hundred day countdown until the 2022 induction, we got to laugh, share some stories, uh, get emotional. Um, it, it was this was a ton of fun, and I, I can't I can't thank you guys enough for uh, helping us kick off these hundred these next hundred days, and and thank you both for taking the time to join us today on the hall call. That's awesome. Well, yeah. I just had one thing I want to add. This came from my pastor. I'm just closing this and let Harry on. My pastor said this, this is one of his favorite verses, 2 Timothy 4, 7. And he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He said, that should remind you of your dad. And uh, it, it meant a whole lot, 2 Timothy 4, 7. I don't know that I can add anything to that. That's, uh, that's a pretty amazing way to end this. I will say that if you're an Old Dominion fan and you happen to be watching this, please come out. Please come out and support this event and support Sonny. Um, his family will be there. I know they would all appreciate it. So. And I'll be saying that in a column just before the uh, just before the event too. I think we'll have a great turnout there. Yeah, we the the excitement is building um, for for your dad, for for Coach Allen, for for everybody. We have a eleven inductees this year, so it's not going to be a uh, it's not going to be a small event. Um, but again. 2022 induction weekend is Saturday, April 30th. It'll be right here in Virginia Beach with events at the Westin, multiple events to choose from. We'll honor the 2020 class, the 2022 class, as well as the 2020 Distinguished Virginian Award recipient, Dennis Elmer from Priority Automotive, uh, at Priority Automotive Group. 
Um, all event and ticket information is available on our website, uh, vasportshof.com. Again, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors who help us put on Hall Call, as well as our induction events, Priority Automotive, the City of Virginia Beach, Optima Health, ESPN Radio 94.1, uh, DAVCON Inc., and our friends at the Hampton Road Sports Commission. Be sure to follow us on all of our social platforms, at VA Sports HOF on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And once again, I'm Will Driscoll with the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, and whatever you do, Participate, don't spectate, and we'll see you again next time.